Hello and good morning everyone. So now today we will be moving forward to our uh, continuation of microbiological revision of USMLE step 1 2021 microbiology. We have previously discussed about this uh, uh, Yersinia enterocolitica and Yersinia pestis which is causing the plague. Now moving forward to this lactose fermenting enteric bacteria. So they are also called as the they are normally found in the intestine. They are lactose fermenting enteric bacteria. They are also sometimes called the coliform bacteria, which is used for the indicator marker of diagnosis the water uh, pollution, whether it is safe to drink or not. If there are the uh, coliform bacteria present, then we say that the, it is contaminated and with the uh, feces or the sewage, and then we discard that water. So water quality is actually um, regarded by the presence of this lactose fermenting type bacteria, which is also called coliform bacteria. Now moving forward for the medical point of importance. Lactose fermenting enteric bacteria ferments the lactose that are pink in colors on Maconchia agar. I will show you the picture. They are usually appears in the pink in color in the Maconchia agar. Examples include the Cytobacter, Enterobac Cytobacter, E. coli, Enterobacter, Klebsiella and Cerasia. You can remember Cytobacter, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella and Cerasia by a formula known as the chick. So Cytobacter, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella and Cerasia. These are the organisms that are pink in color that ferments the lactose. We can even uh, remember from the previous uh, previous our diagram if you remember the division lactose fermenting organism and non-lactose forming organism of gram negative bacteria similar same thing is to remember this chick formula that is the uh, cytobacter enterobacter e coli klebsiella and serasia these are the lactose fermenting bugs e coli produce the beta galactosidase which break down the lactose into glucose and galactose so this is why this uh, lactose they ferment because they have the enzyme to break down that lactose and then then break down into the glucose and galactose by the enzyme known as, known as the beta galactosidase and this once break down this into glucose and gal galactose and then they are able to utilize them remember Maconchia agar, we can remember pink colonies, the are lactose fermenting colony are Cytobacter, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella and Cerasia. And EMB agar, lactose fermenting grow as a purple or black colonies, that is E. coli grows colonies with a green sin. So there can be a light green sin on EMB and they will grow as a purple or black colony on eosin methylene blue agar. So this is the EMB agar, that is different than the Maconchi and in that you can see this purple black colonies with a greenish sheen of Escherichia coli or E. coli. Talking about the Escherichia coli, when you move on one is page 145 where we talk about this Escherichia coli, you have to understand this Escherichia coli is a bug that is a very common in medical field. You can found ton, um, millions and millions of cases if you are dealing with multiple cases you will find the infection with Escherichia coli that will cause mainly three types of disease if you remember they are can cause since it's a gram negative organism it will going to cause you endotoxic shock that you know all gram negative organism can cause endotoxic shock so due to a certain property like it has the fimbriae and capsule so due to fimbriae they are responsible for urine drag infection they will cause cystitis and pyelonephritis whereas the capsulated one will cause pneumonia and neonatal meningitis and this lipopolysaccharide that is endotoxin called septic shock and they have an exotoxin which we have discussed in the exotoxin section like it has enterotoxigenic E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, they have, they have the verotoxin, enterotoxigenic E. coli. So they have heat labile and heat level, heat, uh, heat stable toxin. So these all are the three immediate, three types of disease that can produce and they, that is only the thing which you have to remember till your death. Even we are becoming a great doctor of the world, but you have to understand the Escherichia coli has the three main uh, diseases that it co occurs. It will be by the organism itself due to its virulence factor that will the fimbria will cause cystitis and pyelonephritis and capsulin one will cause pneumonia and meningitis. Then it is a gram negative, all gram negative has endotoxic activity and they will cause endotoxin and septic shock as well as it has another property like exotoxin and due to exotoxin it will produce the disease. So, endotoxin, exotoxin and the bacteria gram negative which is responsible for life. This is endolipopolysaccharide as an endotoxic shock or septic shock. So, it's only three heading if you remember it is will be very easy to remember all the bacteria disease and their uh, what are the disease they can produce, how they medically important to us and we can deal the questions. So, let's move on. 
Stereo coli, this is a gram negative, indole positive rod, E. coli virulence factor are fimbriae or also called pili, which is responsible for your urine tract infection, that is cystitis and pyelonephritis. They can have a capsule, the capsulator bond will cause pneumonia and menuetal meningitis, and LPS, that is endotoxin, will release as the septic shock. So, three things. They also have some exotoxin as well, which we will deal here. There are actually five types of E. coli, which is known as the enteroinvasive E. coli, enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and enteroaggregative E. coli. So there are five which we have to remember actually. So they will re there will be a formula to remember this. I'll deal with it. So you have to understand we are dealing with the five type of E. coli. There are actually five type of E. coli that you have to remember, and they have the names should be remembered like enteroinvasive will cause invasive diarrhea. Enterotoxigenic it will, call, will cause talk, traveler's diarrhea. Enteropathogenic will cause pediatric diarrhea. Enterohemorrhagic will cause hemorrhagic diarrhea leading to the hemolytic uremic syndrome due to these hamburgers. So they will cause hemorrhagic diarrhea due to eating of the hamburgers and their lead complication will be hemolytic uremic syndrome. So there every bacteria name will tell us what were the disease and how to remember it so that we can crack the questions or we can deal with the patient. Okay, let's move on. So intery invasive E. coli, this is microbe invade the intestinal mucosa and cause necrosis and inflammation. So the invasive one with the name it will invade our uh, GI tract mainly the large intestinal mucosa and will cause necrosis and inflammation. Okay, so there will be cause invasive diarrhea. In its short name is EIEC intero invasive E. coli. So it will cause invasive diarrhea, which is resembling of dysentery. Clinical manifestation similar to Sigella. So I think it is very easy to remember. Intero invasive EIEC. It will cause invasive diarrhea. That which is the bloody diarrhea. It will invade where? It will invade your intestinal mucosa, normally the large intestine. That you have understood. Moving forward to enterotoxigenic E. coli, it is name is said, its name short form is ETEC, so enterotoxigenic E. coli. It will produce heat lavile in heat, heat stable enterotoxin, no inflammation, no invasion. So this is just a diarrhea that will is mediated by the exotoxin. So you remember if previous exotoxin where we have talked about the heat stable and heat level, how they work, work, how they are working? They are working by increasing cyclic AMP. So the second messenger is increased inside your cell by activating the adenyl cyclase, there is increase in cyclic AMP, there is increase in cyclic AMP. So there will be influx of the water and electrolyte channels are open and all the water and electrolyte from your cell will lost to the lumen and loss in the form of the diarrhea. So there is no inflammation, no blood, no, this is no invasion, no inflammation, no invasion. This is just a toxin mediated. When you go outside, you know, you in Asia, normally it is very common. You go out for your trekking, you go from outside, you could go from your bus to visit some places. You eat outside the food, they, can, they are mainly contaminated. You eat it, it will develop this. You will get the toxin is there, the toxin will immediately activate your intestine and then act activate the cyclic AMP, then adrenal cyclase due to the activate the cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP there is a flux of this water and electrolyte into lumen and you develop diarrhea. So you beware in the developing countries when you go outside, drink, drinking water and food are very unsafe sometimes and they will develop, the, if you develop the diarrhea then it is because of your enterotoxigenic E. coli. And it is due to a toxin mediated, there is no inflammation, there is no invasion, so you do not have to worry, you will have a few episodes of diarrhea and vomiting and it will resolve itself. Okay, so enterotoxigenic E. coli, also called traveler's diarrhea, this is totally watery diarrhea and due to toxin mediated. It has nothing related to inflammation, it is nothing related to invasion. Like previously, there was necrosis, inflammation, invasion, everything was there. So there was post cell, there was blood, everything is seen in their stool, here only water. Moving forward to the enteropathogenic E. coli. Enteropathogenic E. coli is no toxin production, adheres to the apical surface, flattens the villi and prevent absorption. So it has nothing deal to deal with the toxin mediated, it has nothing to relate to the inflammation, it has nothing to relate to the invasion. It is just going into the intestine, adheres to the apical surfaces, flattens the villi and prevent the absorption. So enteropathogenic E. coli, which is responsible for your pediatric diarrhea. And pediatric diarrhea, what is the mechanism? The bacteria goes there, attached to your intestinal epithelium, flattened it and prevent the absorption. So, since there is no absorption, everything you eat will lose in your 
stool and that's developed diarrhea in a pediatric patient diarrhea usually in the children think of epec it's our famous enteropathogenic enteropathogenic e coli and it causes pediatric diarrhea moving forward to the very important topic it enterohemorrhagic e coli its name is enterohemorrhagic e coli there's only one case from nepal which i have uh, found we uh, uh, when i was a md student in a uh, teaching hospital i was able to find this uh, patient we were able to report it also i'll show you the picture so this is enterohemorrhagic e coli is very serious disease it will cause it is another name or prototypic name is o157s7 so it is a it's it's name only it's, it's a code name you can say it's a name prototypic name proto so it is enterohemorrhagic e coli its name is o157s7 this is one of the common serotype in the us they are responsible for its name is ehec enterohemorrhagic e coli so causing enterohemorrhagic e coli is associated with hemorrhagic diarrhea so you will see as a bloody diarrhea so there will be hemorrhagic but there is no inflammation so there will be no pus actually there will be related to the hamburg and may patient to develop this hemolytic uremic syndrome so hemorrhagic is related to hemolytic uremic syndrome hemorrhagic diarrhea and have relation with the hamburgers so in this way you can crack your question and also able to diagnose your patient let's go through it hemorrhagic intero hemorrhagic e coli this is o157s7 most common type in serum us often transmitted via undercooked meat raw leafy vegetables and bovine feces anything that bovine feces is contaminated suppose uh, your cattle your field in a farm field and now you are eating a raw vegetable or raw say apple fallen in on the ground there may be this bacteria due to this uh, bovine feces has contaminated that ground so anything that is coming from farm and you are not washing it then you have the chance of getting enterohemorrhagic e coli this will develop the hemorrhagic diarrhea they have reduced the toxin called sigal like toxin if you remember we have talked in, in the uh, exotoxin when the proteins in this inhibitor there was the inhibition of elongation factor by diphtheria and pseudomonas and there was another group which is the sigal toxin and enterohemorrhagic e coli which was inhibiting the protein this synthesis by 60 years so the same thing is there this is the sigal toxin causing hemolytic uremic syndrome where there will be the triad of hemolytic uremic syndrome is hemolysis that is anemia thrombocytopenia and kidney injury uremia is due to acute kidney injury due to microthrombi falling on the damaged endothelium so there are the three company complete three there is a, this patient who is developed the hemor enterohemorrhagic e coli will production of the toxin called siga toxin this siga like toxin this will cause hemolytic uremic syndrome and how can we diagnose the hemolytic uremic syndrome hemolytic uremic syndrome patient will develop anemia due to hemolysis of the rbc due to the due to microthrombi and microthrombi are formed due to the platelet so the platelet is reduced there will be thrombocytopenia and due to reduce blood flow there will be the acute kidney injury so there will be anemia thrombocytopenia and acute kidney kidney injury these are due to the microthrombi falling on the damaged endothelium mechanical hemolysis with cystocyte and the peripheral blood so hus can be diagnosed as the the cystocyte and the peripheral blood is smeared platelet consumption will be there low and there will be a decreased renal flow this in this way hemolytic uremic syndrome is developed how do you, why developed due to sigal toxin why sigal toxin has came because of the enterohemorrhagic e coli they develop hemorrhagic diarrhea so dysentery toxin alone causes necrosis and inflammation does not ferment sorbitol versus other e coli and enterohemorrhagic e coli associated with hemorrhagic hamburger and hemolytic uremic syndrome so it is very easy to remember i will talk about this does not ferment sorbitol so we will talk about this entero invasive e coli causing invasive diarrhea like dysentery entero toxin e coli etec causing travelers diarrhea t40 i4i t40 enteropathogenic e coli producing this is no inflammation no uh, invasion but they are producing pediatric diarrhea so p4p enterohemorrhagic e coli causing hemorrhagic diarrhea hemo developing hemolytic uremic syndrome which is a complication now let's move to our let's see so you can see this is Chirichia coli. This is your this is your McConkie agar where you can see this pink color colony. This is due to the lactose fermenter. Once lactose is utilized, they ferment it. Ferment after there will be the production of acid. Due to acid production, there will change in the pH of the media and there will be the indicator which convert into the pink. So they will appear as a pink colony. They are gram negative. You can see they have the multiple peritriclus flagella by which they are motile. 
they are causing the first infection due to the fimbriae and pili causing UTI. So in UTI you can see your endogenous E. coli in your gut that is from your uh, anal canal or say GI tract they are passing over here and in case of female this the both opening the GI opening and the urethral opening is in side by side. So this bacteria So this bacteria will actually enter into the urethral tract and then due to filia and fimbriae they are cannot be washed out and then they can reach to your bladder while they will de develop they will multiply and they develop the urine tract infection this would cause cystitis if not treated they will even move forward and goes to their kidney and cause their pyelonephritis so in this is your endogenous bacteria you can see easily even this this can be prevented by just just you can changing your uh, you give personal hygiene just by changing your washing after your defecation or after your bath after going to um, washroom when you wash for forward then which is a normal habit then you are pulling all this bacteria your normal flora towards your urethra and then into the bladder and into kidney and causing you uti or say pyelonephritis you just change the direction you wash backward so the bacteria will only goes backward not come forward and then you will not develop uti UTI is the very common problem in a female. Almost every female get urine tract infection in her lifetime. So changing of this habit will actually save you from getting urine tract infection because the source you have a tons, you have millions of this esterosha coli in your gut. You cannot remove it. So while washing, if you bring forward, it will enter into your urethra and then goes to your bladder and to your kidney and cause you the urine tract infection. So just by changing your personal hygiene and keeping personal hygiene clean, you will prevent from getting urine tract infection. So now talking about the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, let me show you. This is the, uh, there is other another disease causing the, this hysteria will also causing sepsis, you know, due to a, a endotoxin. They can cause meningitis and pneumonia. They have the capsular strain, which is known as the K1 strain they are actually responsible for meningitis. So you can see the bacterial meningitis can be done it mainly in the children, not in adult or elderly. This gram negative bacteria, especially the Steresia coli cause meningitis. Talking about this enterohemorrhagic E. coli, if you remember, we are talking about this uh, e, e 0157 s 7 that is E. coli ingested. In three or four days, they will develop the abdominal cramp and non-bloody diarrhea. After one and two days, you will develop the bloody diarrhea. And in 95% case, there will be a resolution, but only few of the percent case, they will develop the hemolytic uremic syndrome. If you see the, uh, see the hemolytic uremic syndrome, in 60%, there will be a resolution. Only 3 to 5%, there can be a death. So there can be death due to this hemolytic uremic syndrome. They can also be 5% chronic renal failure, stroke, and other sequelae. In 30%, there will be proteinuria and other minor sequelae. So hemolytic uremic syndrome is a serious disease, enterohemorrhagic E. coli is a very serious concern and they can cause outbreak as well. So you need to be very care for this diagnosis. So we have talked about this.